It's a dangerous world out there. And in spite of the self-stated values that most of us would trot out when queried, the reality is with the sexual assault rates as high as they are, that every one of our children will be exposed to a sexual assault, either as a victim, a perpetrator, or a witness. It's almost unavoidable that someone will have an experience with that. It is the absence of our intervention that makes it possible. It's pretty well known that like the sexual assault rates in this country are at 25%, but the sexual assault rates in indigenous communities are at 50%, five zero. Trafficking has always been an issue. Uh, most of the sex trafficking actually begins with someone who is familiar to the person being trafficked. And there are a whole variety of variables that shape that. So one is for anyone from any community that is economically disadvantaged, it's possible to leverage people with money. And when people are desperate in their Maslow's hierarchy of needs, tier one, food, clothing, shelter is under stress, or if family cohesion has been interrupted, then that creates a special vulnerability. I think there are other special considerations in indigenous communities where, you know, tribes have jurisdiction over enrolled indigenous members of that tribe when one assaults another one, but do not have the same jurisdiction and control over the behavior of non-tribal members when they commit an assault on tribal land. And as a result, people who are not tribal members have had a degree of impunity to tribal justice even though tribes are the primary purveyors of justice within their own communities. And some of the legislation that would remedy that, the Violence Against Women Act needs constant reauthorization by Congress, and sometimes the politicians have a big fight over it. Not all politicians even support tribal sovereignty, and their fights against tribal sovereignty have an impact on the health and safety of indigenous women. So one of the things that strikes me about the Ojibwe culture and its messaging about the role of men comes from our ceremonial drums, where initially all of the men who were seated on those drums were Ojibwe warriors who had killed members of an enemy tribe in battle. This drum was actually a gift from an enemy tribe as a peace offering. And initially all of the Ojibwe men who were seated there were told that you will not kill other human beings. And that someday you will run out of men who've had the experience of killing people from another tribe in combat, which is good. It's really a reminder that our warriors have to lead us to peace and our people will never be at peace until our warriors assume that responsibility. I think this is something that mainstream culture does us a great disservice on. There's a lot of messaging to men about being macho, strong, being in charge. My strongest connections with my own children have not happened when I have pretended to be unfazed by life, but when I've actually opened up about things that have bothered me, hurt me, my scares, worries, and concerns. And I think coaching our young people on how to see and navigate those things is a special responsibility for me as a father. I've always taken that part of my responsibility as a man seriously and tried to impart it to my children. For both boys and girls, their first time being successful as a hunter, we will have a feast and a prayer. And then instead of just eating, we will ritually feed the successful hunter and offer a spoonful of the food and say the person's native name and we'll explain that you've just changed your life and that you'll have a special responsibility now um, and a special power and it's the power to gather resources. You'll have it when you hunt, fish, gather, get a job, but use your power to think of people who don't have enough 
who can't get it for themselves, your family and your community. So a powerful man is not one who takes control of um, or manipulates other people. It's one who thinks of and takes care of others. It's one thing to say we are communal, but that's what it looks like. I think sometimes about like when we, we have ceremonies for a year, when a, a girl becomes a woman, transitions into womanhood in our culture. And among the things that the, you know, aunties and grandmas and female namesakes will tell them is that as you become a woman now, you have a right, but also a responsibility to be respected by men. And here's what that means. No one can hit you. No one can call you names. No one can make you do something sexually that you do not want to do. And I, I think this world would be a different place if we did these kind of ceremonies for all of our girls as they became women with their brothers watching. For all of us, male, female, whatever our age is, we all have at least someone in our circle who have been personally deeply impacted by things like sexual assault. And so we all need the awareness because these things are not spoken of publicly the same way that other important topics are. And they should be centered in our awareness and consciousness and shaping how we interact with the rest of the world. So I think there's a lot of room to grow in that area. And I think our culture has a lot to say and share about how we should grow. This is a really critical topic in our time. It affects everyone's life. So rather than leaving this up to a handful of really passionate advocates, all of us should take responsibility for this. We are all dehumanized anytime anyone is dehumanized. We all do better when we all do better. We all have a responsibility to engineer the safety and humanization of everyone else around us. Our state, their lives, your call.